doubt you. He speaks and I hear him. I do. Don't Is all 
overshadowed with blackness no shelter or help is nigh care Thou not that we perish. How can, how can thou lie asleep when each moment? Each moment seems so madly is threatening a grave in an angry deed. The wind. They shall obey If you say Lord if you just say Peace Just speak the word Whether Whether the wrath The storm, the storm tossed sea, or demons, or men shall, whatever, whatever it be, water can swallow. The sheep where lies the master of ocean and earth and skies. They all. Say is peace, peace, peace. peace. Just speak the word, Lord. Peace. The wind shall obey it, peace. the waves shall obey your word, peace. all creation shall obey. Peace. Be still. Just say, peace be still, Lord. Whenever you say the word, Lord, just speak the word and say, peace. Whenever you say, peace. speak the word peace, Lord. In our homes, in our lives, Lord, say, speak the word peace in our hearts. Speak the word peace in our minds, in our ways, in our walk. All over, Lord, speak the word peace.
on our jobs and our schools. All over the nation, Lord, speak peace. Whenever the Lord says peace, there will be peace. Whenever the Lord says, whenever the Lord says peace, there will be peace. If the master of creation says, if the master of creation says, speak peace in our homes, speak peace in our families, speak peace to our mind, Lord, speak it in our hearts, speak peace to our souls. Speak peace as a healing across the nation. There will be peace. There will be peace. Speak peace in our lives, Lord. In our neighborhood, speak peace. Bring peace to our hearts. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. I'm weak, but thou art strong. Jesus keeps me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long. Let me walk close to thee. Sign me up, sign me up for the Christian Jubilee. I've been changed. Write my name, write my name on the road. I've been changed, I've been changed since the Lord has lifted me. I want to be ready when Jesus comes. When Jesus comes, oh, the trumpets will sound loud. When Jesus comes. All the saints in Christ shall rise. I'm so glad that the Lord has lifted me. I want to be ready when Jesus comes. Sign me up. Sign me up for the Christian Jubilee. 
Write my name. Write my name on the road. I've been changed. I've been changed since the Lord has been with me. I want to be ready when Jesus comes. When Jesus comes, oh, the trumpets will sound loud. When Jesus comes, all the saints in Christ shall rise. I'm so glad that the Lord has lifted me. I want to be ready when Jesus comes. Sign me up. Sign me up for the Christian Jubilee. Write my name. I've been changed. I've been changed since the Lord has lifted me. Oh, I want to be ready when Jesus comes. You know not the day nor the hour he shall appear. But we know in our hearts that he's coming back again. My heart's been fixed. And my mind's been made up. I dare want to be one of these Jesus come. Sign me up. Sign me up for the Christian Jubilee. Write my name. Write my name on the road. I've been changed. want to be ready when Jesus comes. Sign me up. Sign me up for the Christian Jubilee. Write my name. Write my name on the road. I've been changed. I've been changed since the Lord has lifted me. I want to be ready when Jesus Let's go.
appeared to the disciples. He's walked through closed doors in a glorified body. And don't ask me what kind of body is that because you and I don't know, but we'll find out one day when we receive ours and then it won't matter. But he walked through locked doors and appeared to the disciples to encourage them because you remember after he died on the cross, they became fearful for their own lives and they went up to the upper room and they stayed there. First time he appeared to them, everybody was there but Thomas. And after Jesus left, we don't know how long it was that Thomas came. But anyway, the other disciples told Thomas, we'll see the Lord. He is alive like the women told us. And then Thomas responded by saying, I won't believe it unless I personally examine his physical body. So Jesus, for the sake of Thomas, came back a second time and went through locked doors and personally walked up to Thomas because the other disciples had seen him and told Thomas, give me your hand, and I want you to feel the nail prints in my hand. And I also want you to feel where the spear gouges into my side. And after Thomas felt physically his body, then Thomas he believed and he bowed down and he said, oh Lord, my God. And then Jesus responded to Thomas by saying, Thomas, you believe because you saw and you felt me. And it brought faith on your part. But those who will never see me, who we are those, they will never feel my hand, the nail prints in my hand, nor the uh, thrust and the gash in my side, but yet they by faith will believe me, blessed are them. So we are blessed this morning, amen? We haven't seen him in the flesh, but we believe. And we believe because he said it. Now that ends the 20th chapter. The beginning of chapter 21, John says that after Jesus left, 
for whatever reason, and he does not explain why, but Peter became restless. And undoubtedly, there had been previous conversations between him and the other disciples, the other brothering, about what they were going to do and uh, when was Jesus coming back. And Peter made a decision on his own that he was going to leave. And John records all of the incident, what Peter said, what he did, and how Jesus responded. So he opens up chapter 21 by saying, Peter makes a statement, I'm going fishing. And he wasn't just talking about uh, taking advantage of idle time, waiting on Christ to come back. But literally, in the Greek language, it meant that he was cutting off his ties with Jesus. He was going back to the fishing enterprise where Jesus once saw him and called him to follow him. He no longer wanted to preach and, and continue the commission that Christ had given him and the other disciples. In other words, he was quitting quitting indefinitely. And he didn't want to have anything in terms of fellowship to do with Jesus anymore. He was not going to serve him anymore. He was not going to follow him anymore. And so when Peter said this, the other disciples said, well, we're going with you. Again, in the Greek language, we're not just going to walk with you, but we're going back to the fishing business also with you. So they go back, and they get in Peter's boat, and they fished all night, John says. And naturally, we know this has to be true because John is with them. So he's recording what happened while they fished all night. Now, we got to understand that they're fishing all night. That's not saying much to us in this uh, 21st century. But these men were not just uh, uh, fishermen that did it for a sport or occasionally they fished. This was their business, this was their livelihood. And they had been doing this ever since they were young. Their parents, their fathers, had taught them how to fish. They taught them how to look for the fish. When was the best time to fish? Where to go to fish, and et cetera. They were taught the trade, the fishing trade, amen? So they were professional fishermen. And naturally, nighttime is the best time to fish. How many of you men try to fish, have fish, think you can fish? Raise your hand. Okay. You know that the, okay, all right. Okay, Donnie, all right, God bless you, all right. You know the best time to fish is at night. Why? It's cool. Why? Because the fish come up closer to the surface of the water. When it's hot during the day, they go down deep where it's cooler in the water, right? Okay. Peter and them, they know this. All right. And that's the reason why they went out at nighttime. See, I'm trying to get you in your mind mentally to set this scenario so you can easily understand why Peter did what he did, why Jesus said what he said. John said they were out there all night long, which meant that when daybreak, they're tired, they're smelling fishy, they're worn out, they are hungry. And not only that, but they're a little bit vexed and a little bit maybe angry in their spirits because they didn't catch anything. Jesus, John tells us, he's standing on the shore. He knows what's going on. In fact, he was the one who made certain they were not going to catch anything that night because we're told that Jesus in the Greek performed a miracle. And even though they went out at night and the fish should have been there, but since Jesus is God and he spoke and created the fish, he made certain that no fishes would go into their nets. Amen? So that was a miracle. 
So when he asked them, have you caught anything, he knew that the only reply they could give to him is no. He knew that they had not caught, it, caught anything. So when he asked them, have you caught anything, and again in Greek, he is implying children under instruction. In other words, you are still learning how to be a disciple. You're still learning in terms of growing in your faith. Children, not men under, uh, under instruction, but children, like in the what, kindergarten, elementary school, first, second, and third grade, you're still learning, not how to fish, but you're still learning in terms of what it means to follow Jesus. And that same illustration and that same statement principle can apply to all of us right now. None of us has arrived. All of us are still children of God under what? Construction, our uh, instruction, forgive me. We're still learning, we're still growing. When is it that we stop learning and growing? When the Lord calls us home. That's when the instruction, that's when school is out. Diplomas are given and you throw up your, top, your tassel. Amen? All right. They said, no master, we have not caught a thing. So then Jesus said, well, where the boat is, and John said, we were just a few hundred yards from the shore out in the water, which means that they really were in shallow water, not deep water. So Jesus says, right where you're at, take your net and drop it over the side of the boat. Now, they have fished at least about a third of that lake in deep water all night long, by what, 12, maybe 13 hours, didn't catch a thing, nothing in the net. Now, Jesus says, just drop it on the side of the boat. So they drop the net on the side of the boat. What happens? When they go to pull the net up, there's so many fishes in the net. The net is so heavy, they can't even, as strong as they are, they can't even lift the net and put it in the boat. So they had to drag the net to shore. Okay, now, let me, let me interject right here. John, parenthetically, which means, let's say, he injects a statement there, and he says the number of fish that they caught was 153 fish. John had never, when they were fishing uh, 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 other, other times, they didn't count how many fish they had in the net. If they had a net full, they would say, we had a lot of fish, and cared them, you know, and cleaned them, and, and then sold them. Why did he number the fish? That doesn't make sense. Wouldn't you agree? Remember we injected this. We said that in Ephesians 3.20, what does it say? There's a, there's a benediction that, that, that God gives that. He says that, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than what you and I can ask or imagine. It won't even come in my mind. Mm -hmm. To him that worketh his power in us. To him be the glory. Where? In the church, because the church belongs to him. And in Christ Jesus, what? Throughout all generations, everybody, continuously, forever and ever. John was given a report to let us know, or his readers later on to know, that when God blesses, he blesses abundantly. He just doesn't give you a few fishes to eat, to sustain you, but he gives you a whole lot of fishes. Amen. And he does more than you even ask him for or that you could even imagine that God will do. Is God not doing the same thing today in your life and my life? 
Well, if he is, why don't you say amen? If he ain't, then say he ain't. Okay. Now, if anybody here, here says that God ain't working abundantly in your life, then you don't belong to him. Because any child of God, God is going to bless them more than they deserve to be blessed. Amen? Now, let me back up a little way because we're looking at this lesson, right? The reason why they fell, I said, is because Jesus spoke to make certain that the fish didn't go into their net. Now, they got what? An overabundance of fish. What is he saying to them that they didn't catch then? Without Jesus in your life, when you don't obey him, no matter how smart you are, how intellectually astute you are, you will fail at doing your thing your way. They failed at their fishing business. But when you do it Jesus' way, when they obeyed him and dropped the net, they became a success. When you obey him and you live your life the way he that he wants you to live it, you will be a success. Maybe not according to what men think success is, but according to what God wants you to be. See, many times we get caught up, and I'm gonna get to this uh, in a few moments. We get caught up in man's standard of success. And when you try to prove to people that you are success, you're gonna run yourself ragged. You're gonna break your health. It's gonna destroy you. God did not create us to prove to anybody who we are and how successful we are. Let me say this. Does it make sense? I'm a bag of dust, atoms and, and and I'm going, I, he created me from the dust, and I'm going back to the dust, right? Now, does it make sense? I'm a dust creature, you a dust creature, so I'm going to try to prove to you that I'm a better dust creature than you are. That does not make sense. That's stupid. But that's what we do. That's what we do. Amen. I know you don't want to say amen. You know I'm telling the truth. Because somebody in the apostle is doing it right now on your job. And you're using the excuse that you want to make certain that you keep your job and that you're promoted. No, you're just trying to prove to those folk that you can do it and that maybe you are a step, a level, a little bit above them. Let me move on. Now, Jesus, he's got to find a way to bring Peter and the other disciples back to him. Now, that's the crises. Crises always come in all of our lives. I remember the crises that emptied forth in my life before my mother passed. She had her own apartment. Maybe I'll share this with you. And when uh, the disease of Alzheimer's came on her, she had been so used to being independent, taking care of herself, cooking her own meals and doing this. But there were tell, telltale signs that my sister told me about that something was wrong. She would put maybe some grits or maybe some oatmeal on, a, on the stove, on the burner, and she would forget it was there. One time she almost burned her apartment. And there'll be other things that she was forgetting. And my sister called me up and told me, she said, uh, I'm gonna speak to mama and try to see if she will give up her apartment and move in with me. And I shared with my sister, I said, don't do that. I said, because if you do, she's going to object. She's going to get angry. She's going to be offended because now she feels as though she can handle herself. I said, the only thing we can do is pray that God will open her heart and she will realize she can no longer live independently and she will tell you when she's ready to move in with you. 
Well, it went about a whole year, you know, and my sister would rush over there every day to make sure the apartment wouldn't burn down. Finally, one day, she rushed over, the, uh, rushed over there, and they were just talking. And my mother said, you know what? I don't think that I can sustain this apartment anymore by myself. Uh, do you think it would be any problem if I moved in with you? And my sister almost started shouting. And when she called my boss, I told her, I said, see how God works. I said, now, if you had tried to make her do it, you would have hurt her. You would have destroyed her. But God worked on her heart. And see how the transition was from one place to another. Christ sees a rise in all of our lives. In fact, some of our, somebody listening to me now, you in the midst of a crisis. Yeah. It could be in your marriage, your job, your children, your health, whatever it is. Crises are part of the framework and the, the woven pattern of life. How can he get those disciples to come back? Because with Peter, being the ringleader, the renegade, he has led the others away. Jesus has been training them for three and a half years. What has he been training them for? He has given them an assignment to go out and to carry the good news for him. Why? Because he's getting ready to go back to his father. His assignment down here is almost over with. And he's got to leave because he's already told them the Holy Spirit is coming and he's going to take up his assignment. He ain't got time to, to stay down here another three years and train them. Some has got to give. There's a crisis. So what does Jesus do? He does not beat them with a whip. He does not tell them how stupid they are, how dumb they are. If you don't do what I tell you to do, I'm going to call down fire from heaven and I'm going to kill all of them. Like some of us, some human folk would do. He gently brings them back step by step. The first step was he didn't let them catch anything. The next step was he gave them more than what they deserve. Grace, mercy. Do you all see that? It's so it, it's, it's evident here in the context. Then the next step, he's cooking some fish and some biscuits and some grits and scrambled eggs. He's got some sorghum syrup, and they can smell it out there in the boat. And he says, children, come on in. I know you're tired and hungry. Get something to eat. So he gives them fish and bread. They ate. Now their stomachs are satisfied. They have been warmed by his fire. They feel better. Everything is okie dokie now. Jesus seizes the opportunity. He doesn't approach anybody, he doesn't talk to anybody but Peter, and he addresses Peter in front of all of them because Peter was the one who brought all of them away from him. So if he can turn Peter around, the rest will just fall in line. Peter! Can I, can I put a little humor in this? Is it all right? Does you love me, boy? Oh, you know I love you. Peter, does you love me? Oh, you know I love you, Master. Peter, do you love me? I'm getting mad. Peter's getting mad now. Why does he keep on asking me, do I love him? I've already told him that I love him. Do my will. When he started talking about feeding the lambs and the sheep, he's talking about executing his mission, proclaiming the good news. Now, do you see Satan's plot in the midst of all of this? Satan couldn't stop Jesus from dying. 
He couldn't stop him from executing the plan of redemption by going to the cross. He couldn't keep him in the grave. But if he can stop his disciples from carrying the good news, the plan of salvation, then that's going to put a, 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 a log jam and out of all that he did and died on that cross and getting up out of the grave, if they don't carry it so that sinners can hear the good news and be saved, then Satan is one. You see how diabolical Satan is? And let me say this. Whenever God gives you a victory in your life over Satan, don't be celebrating and grinning and smiling and thinking that he ain't coming back again. He doesn't mind losing round one. In fact, he doesn't mind losing round two, three, four, five, six, and seven, as long as he can win the fight. You hear what I said? And you know the reason why he wants to win the fight, because he wants to destroy you. He wants to kill your spirit. He wants to rip your faith out like ripping the heart out of you. He wants you to deny your Lord like he did. He wants you to walk away from God. He wants you to give up on Jesus Christ. Peter, do you love me? We hear that word love. We are living in a sex-oriented society. All this world knows is sex and pleasure. Everything, every product that is sold has got to have directly sex connected with it or indirectly implied some sex. We got sex therapies and sex psychoanalysis and sex counseling. These are terms that are about 20, 30 years ago never heard of before. People use the expression, uh, uh, I love the way you're wearing your hair. I love the way you walk. I love your mind, Flint. You got your very intelligent person. I love your eyes. I love the way you dress. I love your car. I love your home. You're so beautifully decorated. I love this. I love that. I love your children. They're so mannerable. We use the word love flippantly. And for most of us, the word love only means what? A physical thing. And we are implying if the senses are satisfied with this love action, we're all right. That's not the kind of love that Jesus is telling.